Governor Mike Huckabee. stood up. I thought you were leaving. I thought that was, was going to be a very small audience I'd be speaking to. Thank you so much for staying. That's uh, quite gracious. Uh, what he was saying, I was named as one of the five best governors back when I was in office. Uh, there was one adjective that was left out, one of the five best unindicted governors. I just wanted to throw that in. That's the, uh... You know, we were always grateful for some of the governors in Illinois because it made us feel less self-conscious about many that we had sent to prison. In fact, we used to say in Arkansas, the five most feared words of an Arkansas politician are these, will the defendant please rise? <laughs> Folks, I want to thank you very much for giving me the forum, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to visit with you about some of the issues that our country faces. And I come here today with a simple message. Our country is in trouble. It's not a message that probably would shock or surprise you to hear me say, but when sometimes people say, well, in what way? Most people think we're in trouble economically, and we are. We've lost 5 million manufacturing jobs since the year 2000. 60,000 manufacturing plants have closed since that time. Our trade deficit is $11 trillion since the year 1990. Now those figures may not mean a lot, but what it means is there are a lot of people, many of whom you know, who just a few years ago had a good job, good paycheck, benefits, a pension plan. They took good care of their family. They put food on the table, clothes on their kids' back. They were putting aside a little money to send their kids to school. And today those folks who once had good jobs are now working two and three part-time jobs that pay them less cumulatively that the one job used to pay. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Nathan, South Carolina. And we were staying at a Fairfield Inn there. I got up early in the morning and got down to breakfast at 6 a.m. when they opened. And I was the only one there. I guess everybody else decided to sleep in. So I'm sitting there by myself, and uh, the guy that is working in the kitchen for the Fairfield Inn and picking up the breakfast dishes comes out, recognizes me, introduces himself, and we have a conversation. His name was Mark. And Mark told me his story. He is a guy who is in his 50s, had been working for the same manufacturing plant for over 25 years there in Aiken, South Carolina. Three years ago, that plant closed. All the jobs shipped to Mexico. All 300 people lost their jobs, including Mark. He's a college educated and accountant. He wasn't working on the factory floor. He was in the main office. But it wasn't just the factory floor workers who lost their jobs. Everyone did, including him. So now Mark is working three part-time jobs, starting at 5.30 in the morning at the Fairfield Inn, picking up breakfast dishes. A guy who just three years ago was working in a suit and tie as an accountant for a major company. And between that job and the other two part-time jobs that he has, none of which have any benefits whatsoever, he's trying to hang on for dear life because his house is almost paid for. He can't afford to let it go and be foreclosed on, and he can't afford to move, and he can't find anything else because a guy in his 50s is just not that all, all that desirable anymore to a lot of companies. This is the tragedy that is not only true for Mark, but true for a lot of Americans all across this country. When people ask me, do you think the number one problem in America is the economy? I say, well, I don't know that I can define it down to one. Well, is it national security? Folks, our country is in trouble when it comes to understanding the threats that we face in the world. I've taken a little heat this past week with some comments I made, not one of which I have walked back, apologized for. Because to me, it makes no sense whatsoever to free up $150 billion 
to a terrorist state who for 36 years have made very clear that their intentions are to wipe Israel off the face of the map and then come for America. And they chant death to America even as we sit at the table and supposedly negotiate with them. And while that is going on, four hostages, including an American pastor, sits in an Iranian jail and we should have at least insisted that before we ever open up a conversation, that Pastor Abedini and those other three Americans were on the airplane back to the United States and say, I read the Folks, this is like helping to put the bullet in the gun that is pointed to our head. And the full enactment of this ill-fated an ill-conceived idea of a negotiation and an agreement with a fanatical, radical Islamic government is like cocking the hammer and then inviting them to squeeze the trigger. And so I use the most graphic language I can imagine to express that when we don't take the threats of a government seriously, no matter how silly they may sound to us, History tells us that the end of that movie does not come out well. And I, for one, having been to Auschwitz three different times, having visited Israel dozens of times, going back for 42 years since July of 1973, exactly 42 years ago this month when my first trip was made there as a 17-year-old student, I purposed in my heart no matter what the criticism, I am not going to stand by silently while the President of the United States and his Secretary of State ink a deal with people who have openly threatened to create what they say would be another Holocaust in Israel. Those are their words. I didn't make up those words. I'm repeating what they said. I take seriously when governments threaten to kill people. And I wish that this current administration did as well. So people say, what's the most important issue? The economy, national security. And I always say, that's like asking me, which wing of the airplane is most important? The one on the left or the one on the right? Every time I fly, which I did this morning to get here, and which I will do immediately after I leave here today, Every time I get on an airplane, I kind of look to see that both wings are firmly attached to the fuselage. It just flies back. But there's one other thing that that airplane needs. Our other words, those two wings will simply fly to the crash site. That airplane needs a steering mechanism. It needs a rudder. It needs ailerons. It needs flaps. I and mean, so when some people say, what's most important? Is it the economy? Is it national security? I tell people both of those are important, but do not forget that there has to be a steering mechanism, and in our form of government, the steering mechanism is a moral clarity based on the objective truth that some things are right, some things are wrong, and without a moral foundation, our great republic cannot stand because it was based on the notion that we self-govern according to the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. That's exactly what our founders believed. Today we have those who would defy those laws and believe that laws are whatever we wish them to be based on whatever we wish they could be. A few weeks ago when the extreme court made its irrational and illogical decision to redefine marriage. I found it astonishing as I read through 120-something pages of their decision and the four dissents from the more level-headed justices who actually apparently read the Constitution before trying to redefine it. But I thought it was most noted that Justice John Roberts made the comment that it was not possible for five unelected lawyers. And parenthetically, let me note that it is highly out of character for the Chief Justice 
to refer to his colleagues as anything other than my esteemed colleagues, to my good friends on the court, to the justices of our great court. He didn't call them any of those distinguished names. He said, five unelected lawyers. It was really a term of derision in a very stunning way. And the most powerful thing he said after outlining what an absurd conclusion that the majority had come to, he said, who do we think we are? And I would suggest man believes that it can redefine marriage. It's apparent that man believes that he has become his own God. And this is a dangerous place for America to be. So I would tell you that Yes, we need to address the economic concerns of the people of our country, and we must. And yes, we must address the national security threats to our country. We must. But if that's all we do, and we do not come back to the understanding that the only explanation for this great republic of ours is the intervention of God's providence, then we will never see this nation rise to its greatness again. Because that is the only explanation for how we came into being, how we have been sustained, and the only explanation of how we can ever hope to go forward. We need to be a nation under God that unapologetically recognizes that the founders of our country, regardless of what they personally practiced, they clearly understood that there was a God to whom we ultimately will answer, and our laws need to reflect His. There are many people in this country who are living in dire poverty, poverty that is really unnecessary. And many people have felt that if we just spent more money in government programs, we could eliminate poverty. <laughs> Folks, we've been at this now since 1965 when Lyndon Johnson engaged in the war on poverty. We have actually more people and a greater percentage of people in poverty today than we did when we started the war over $2 trillion later. Why hasn't it worked? Because we didn't understand not only the nature but we didn't understand the solution. And this is a bipartisan issue. At least it should be. This is not about saying Republicans have all the great ideas and Democrats have all the wrong ones. Because I, I've sometimes chided members of my own party, the Republican Party, and saying just cutting taxes and reducing government spending is not a cure-all, especially for poverty. And to my friends on the left, I, I will tell them, just spending more money and creating more government bureaucratic jobs and Having a new program, that will not eliminate poverty either. Now the reason I know a little bit about that is because I grew up in poverty. I'm not a rich kid. I did not grow up blue blood. I grew up blue collar. Folks, my dad was a firefighter. And on his days off, he worked as a mechanic. Two jobs. Neither of which paid enough to pay the rent on the little orange brick rent house that I grew up in on 2nd Street in Hope, Arkansas. But between the two of them, we could at least make the rent payments, not much more. My dad never finished high school. His dad didn't either. His dad before him never finished high school. In fact, no male upstream from me had ever finished high school, ever. I'm the first, and certainly the first to go into college. I tell people I grew up in a household, like probably some of you, whose dads just did hard work, heavy lifting, and got dirty at work every day because of what he had to do. Came home having sweated through his clothes. That's just the way we, we thought work was all about. I, I put it this way. At my house growing up, the only soap we ever had in our house was lava soap. <laughs> Fortunately, some of you actually know what that is. I speak to some Ivy League college campuses and the kids look at me like, Lava, what is that? <laughs> and so I try to explain to them, let me put it this way. I was in college before I found out it isn't supposed to hurt when you take a shower. <laughs> some of you ladies will probably at some point this year go to a spa, spend a little money getting an exfoliation. <laughs> pay a hundred or two hundred dollars to have your skin exfoliated. A bar of lava will do the same thing. 
But I don't want to give any of these men ideas that they can go home, give their wives a bar of lava for Valentine's and say, here, honey, go exfoliate yourself. Because your skin may be coming off and lava won't even be involved. I, I simply reference that to tell you that I do not come from some place where I grew up sitting at the head table. I came up from the folks who served the food from the kitchen and waited on the tables. I was a whole lot more comfortable with the people working in the kitchen than I was the folks sitting at the head table. I had to learn how to sit at the head table and tie a tie. I knew exactly how to clean the dishes. And so poverty for me is not something that I've read about. It's something that I've understood. And one of the things that I am quick to tell people, nobody living in poverty wants to be there. There's a ridiculous notion that people who are poor really like it and want to stay poor, and they just want the government to give them more stuff. And I say, look, let me explain something to you. People who are poor would rather not be poor, but there comes a point at every time when they try to get out of the hole of poverty and the government programs keep putting its foot on their faces and pushing them back down the ladder, there comes a point at which people do give up. And at that point, when they don't think there's any way they'll ever get out of the hole, they at least start saying, then could you make the hole a little nicer? Yeah. Folks, our goal ought not to be to see if we can make the hole nicer. It ought to be, can we get people out of that hole and on their own to And one way to do that is to make sure that the various programs, benefits, that sometimes people do need as they move up the ladder, don't have an arbitrary cutoff point so that if a single mom with a couple of kids is getting Medicaid, Section 8 housing, WIC, food stamps, and then all of a sudden if she goes to a job and she makes one dollar over the threshold for qualification of those programs, her kids go from being at least tolerably well off to utterly impoverished without a roof over their heads, food on their table, and health care to take care of their illnesses. And at that point, I say, don't blame the single mom for taking advantage of the programs. Blame a government that punishes her for going to work rather than one that would reward her for going to work and doing better for But here's the harsh reality that now walks us into the area of great danger. I, not for you, but for me. I'm about to step on it here, folks. Because I can say what I just said and people can say amen. Now what I'm about to say is so politically incorrect that I'll probably be reading about myself on the front pages of papers all over America tomorrow. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> The single greatest contributor to poverty is the breakdown of the traditional family of one man and a husband and one wife and a mother raising their children in a loving environment. Only 17% of African American children reach the age of 17 with a mother and a father who are also the biological parents of that child. I want to repeat that. Only 17% of young African Americans will get to the age of 17 who will still be living in the same house with their biological mother and father. 72% of the births in the African-American community now are births to an unwed mother. And the fact is, if a child grows up in a home with both a mother and a father, both of whom have a minimum of a high school education and who are gainfully employed, there's a 91% chance that child will never spend one single day in poverty. If you take away the mother or the father, and you take away the bare minimum of a high school education, and you take away gainful and consistent employment, there is now an 87% chance that that child will spend most of his growing up in poverty. The turn is dramatic. 
So when people say, what are we going to do to fight poverty? The real answer, long term, is not, let's put some more money into yet another government program. Yes, there are some reforms that we desperately need to do, like the ones I've described before. But at some point, we need to start articulating that the single most important thing we can do for this country is to build the moral foundation that says kids need a mother and a father. They need parents who are committed to them, not just committed to giving them birth and then disappearing and becoming completely absentee mothers or fathers and letting someone else even be at the state to raise those kids. We must get back to that, and that is not a government program. That is a moral revolution in a country that needs to get back on its knees and remember that that's why God gave its children. We have some serious challenges in the way that we have denigrated life itself. You see, I, I believe that the foundation of our country can be found in that phrase in the Declaration of Independence that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But let me be quick to say that we've not really fully embraced that notion and we must. To say that all of us are equal, it's been a doctrine, but it hasn't always been practiced. It took almost a hundred years before we recognized that African Americans were every much as equal as a person who's white. And it took another 50 or 60 years before we recognized that women were equal to men. So I understand that through the course of our American history, our words didn't always match our practice, but the but the words, the doctrine, the idea, it was at least there. And to say that all of us are created equal means something to me. And, and it means something to me as a kid who grew up as that poor kid in South Arkansas. Because my mother always reminded me that I was as good as anybody else at school. Maybe my clothes weren't as nice. Maybe my house wasn't as modern. Maybe we never had a new car. We didn't have air conditioning or carpet on the floor. I'm always amazed now. Everything that, that I've worked so hard to get away from is now in style. <laughs> now everybody's getting rid of carpet and they have hardwood floors. I grew up with hardwood floors. Now everybody wants hardwood floors. The difference is the ones I had, you would get a splinter running through the house. <laughs> but she always drilled into me. No one is better than you, but you're never better than somebody else. I'm grateful I had that kind of training from a mother and a father. So I grew up understanding that nobody was better than me just because they were white. Nobody was worse than me because they were black. Nobody who was richer or poorer or better or worse. No one who was more talented or less talented was better or worse. And to this day, I still believe that the child with Down syndrome is just as valuable and has the exact intrinsic worth as the captain of the football. I want you to know, I am not a pro-life person because I got into politics and thought that that would be a popular platform on which to build my, my political life. I got into politics because I'm pro-life and believe that if we do not accept the intrinsic worth and value of every single human life from the moment of conception, we are violating the very spirit of our declaration that gave us our independence. The denigration of human life in our culture has been made more remarkably and more starkly clear this week because of the revelations from the videos that were secretly taped at Planned Parenthood facilities across the country. If anybody can watch those videos and can watch medical doctors who are supposedly trained to heal callously and with a cavalier attitude, chomp on a salad, sipping wine, and speak of trading body parts as if they're trading the parts to a used Buick. Anyone who can watch that and listen to them talk about the harvesting of human hearts and livers and kidneys and selling them 
and to do it while having a conversation and wishing about selling enough so they can own a Lamborghini. If anyone can see that and not be repulsed to the point of saying enough is enough, then I can only surmise that person has what the Bible calls a seared conscience. No longer able to feel the twinge of guilt we should feel. At the heart of this nation ought to be an understanding that every life has value. That there's no such thing as a life that's disposable or expendable. That there's no person that we should look at and say, how can we discard this person? How can we deem this person worthless enough to get rid of? But rather we should look at every human life and say, this life has value. Its value does not come from its designation by God. Its value does not come because of its last name, how much land his or her father owns, what neighborhood he or she lives in. This child has worth because as the founder said, it has been endowed with certain unalienable rights by its creator, by God himself, from which we derive our power and our very existence and our right to be equal. Now we have developed over the past 42 years a doctrine in this country, again coming from an illogical, irrational, and I would suggest to you unconstitutional extreme court ruling that somehow reached out into the thin air, grabbed the word privacy, and applied it to taking the life of an unborn child. And since that time, 60 million unborn children have died in what should have been the safest place on God's green earth, the mother's womb. 60 million. Now I suggest to you that if we continue to justify this slaughter, because we say that, well, a person should have the right to do that if the presence of that baby presents a social disruption or an economic hardship, which is usually the rationale for an abortion, isn't it? And here's what we say. Well, the mother just says she can't afford it. So for the purpose of an economic hardship, we would say the child is not worth whatever hardship it may create for the biological mother. Or, if this baby is carried to full term, the biological mother may lose her boyfriend or may alienate her mother or father or husband or friends or have to drop out of law school. And so this notion that the basis of taking the life of a human being is because of economic uh, hardship or because of social disruption, think what we're saying to the younger generation coming behind us. We're saying to them that the reason that it is okay to devalue a human life to the point of ending the human life is economic hardship or social disruption. Now fast forward when that generation who have been taught this lie is now our caretakers when at the end of life spectrum. And when we become an economic hardship to our children and a social disruption because they've got to come check on us on the weekend rather than going to the lake, we have now for several generations taught them exactly what they are free to do, and that is take our lives out of their way and in the economic hardship and in the social disruption. And I don't know about you, I am not going to make it that easy on my kids. I am going to stand for life from the beginning of conception until the end of natural conclusion. I know that this is not a political meeting per se. It's not a meeting in which you're going to endorse a candidate. That's really too bad. <laughs> but I also have to say very candidly to you that yes, I'm a Republican, but I don't ever want to be stereotyped as a Republican that fits some type of, of particular mold that we have come to grips with. I was a Republican governor in a state where Republicans were more on the endangered species list than Cecil the Lion. 
<laughs> I was the first one elected in about 25 years, only the fourth in 150 years. When I got elected lieutenant governor, I was the only one in the Capitol. They were so excited to see me, they nailed my door shut from the inside. That is a true story. It stayed shut for 59 days. 59 days. It was a rough introduction to Arkansas politics, which, by the way, most people don't know this, but Arkansas was the most hardcore partisan Democratic state in the country. It made Illinois look red. <laughs> Oh, yeah. More than Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, Oregon, California. In our House of Representatives, 89 out of 100 of the House members were Democrats. In the Senate, 31 out of 35 were Democrats. And across the state, over 90% of all of the elected officials at the local and county level, all the Democratic Party. So when I tell you that I was not exactly heralded when I was elected into office, I'm not kidding. It was a brutal environment. And in that environment, you wouldn't think that a guy who was a Republican in a very democratic state that had been dominated by the politics of Bill and Hillary Clinton for 20 years would possibly have a chance to get reelected. But not only did I get repeatedly reelected with the highest number of votes ever as a Republican, but there are a couple of things that I attribute that to. One, I treated people the same irregardless of their political affiliation, their race, any other criteria. That'll surprise some people on the left. The fact is, I appointed more African Americans to high level executive positions than Bill Clinton did. And there were more African Americans who had major positions in state government than it ever had. I increased the percentage of business that the state did with minority owned firms by 400% from what it had ever been before. And in having the most diverse administration in the history of the state, at the time I ran for re-election as governor, I received 49% of the African American vote in my state. Now I would challenge you to find any Republican, white or black in any state in this country who's ever received 49% of the minority vote in his or her state, I don't think you'll be able to do it. And I'm telling you that because I refuse this notion that people ultimately vote for their party. You see, I have a different view of politics, and if I had no paddle, I'd never been elected in a state that normally never let a Republican get above 37, 38 percent as the ceiling of running for office. And here's the view. That for most of us who are engaged in the process of politics and who are political activists who actually go to the meetings. For most of us, we tend to see everything horizontally. We see things as left, right, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, and so we look at politics through the prism of the horizontal. But for most people out there who are not engaged in the hardcore activist of politics, Quite frankly, they don't look at things like we do. They don't see it on the horizontal spectrum. They look at it vertically. What they want to know is, are you going to take us up or will you take us down? Will things get better or will they get worse? And while those of us in the political realm are always arguing horizontally, the people are begging for someone to act and govern vertically and take them up, not down. And I am convinced that it doesn't matter what party we have, it matters what kind of direction we are going. And if we can say to people that we know how to build jobs, we know how to treat people fairly and evenly, we understand the nature and the soul of poverty and how to overcome it, we have a commitment to making it so that that person who lost his job will get it, that one of those five million people whose homes have been in foreclosure over the last eight years is not being completely forgotten. And while we're bailing out the biggest banks in the investor class and just leaving it to the good hopes and fortunes for the working class, there is an answer to make sure that we don't leave people behind. And I'm convinced that there is a great need in this country for us to address the folks who do lift the heavy things every day, who do sweat through their socks every day, who go to church each week, who do not buy in on the nonsense that we can kill 60 million more babies over the next 42 years and that God won't richly judge us for it. I'm convinced this country can get back on its feet, but it can until it first gets on its knees and repents. And when we do that, we can do it. So I 
close here today with this admonition. Let's never be ashamed of what we stand for. Let us never somehow believe that we need to be reticent and afraid to boldly declare the source of the hope that is within us. I refuse to be pessimistic about our future. I refuse to believe that the best days of America are the ones we see in the rearview mirror. I absolutely insist that we look at the best days of America through the windshield. I got five grandkids now. And the reason I got back into politics after being out of it for the past six years and really enjoying, quite frankly, a pretty good life. <laughs> and that good life is built on not being a candidate or an office holder, which I've been doing for about 25 years. That's hard work, folks. It's hard to be a candidate and run for office. It's really hard to hold office and, and try to juggle all the responsibilities. But frankly, over the last six years, I've just talked about the people who are running for office and holding office. That's the easiest job I ever had in my life. And it paid better than anything I've ever done. The only reason I've walked away from it is because I've got five grandkids. And I care very much what happens to them. I've been blessed to live the life I've lived because I've lived in the United States of America. And I want my grandkids to live in America as good for them as this country has been for me. And I want to ask you to join with me in the effort to make America great again by dealing with the economic challenges the challenges of national security, but never forgetting that none of that will matter if we are not a righteous nation that ultimately does what is right before a holy God. Thank you, and God bless you.